Okay, so we are now recording. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists, um, Callie Custers, who is a, a public health analyst um, with uh, HHS. She will tell us more about all of that. Um, Janae Hollinger, who uh, is also a, a public health analyst um, in uh, Health and Human Services, but in a very different branch. So we'll hear a very different side of things, different kind of paths. Um, and finally, Brandon um, Graves, who is a, a worksite wellness consultant with Optum. Unfortunately, we did have a fourth panelist, Anaga Shridhara, who um, is in uh, strategic communications with the Office of the Surgeon General. Um, but as you can imagine, with uh, recent confirmations, um, she has had a last minute meeting come up um, and won't be able to, uh, to attend today. However, if you did want her information or to connect with her on LinkedIn, um, she did say she would be happy to connect with anyone um, or, or to have me share that information. So just let me know if you'd like to connect with her. Um, and if not, she'll actually be at the Student um, and Alumni Night of Networking, which is happening um, on April 8th. So if you do want to still talk with her, she will be there. Um, okay, so moving on um, to our panelists who are here. Thank you. Um, we will maybe go ahead and start with Callie. Would you mind um, just quickly introducing us, telling us a little bit more about yourself, um, about kind of the nature of your job and organization? Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Callie. I um, graduated from Maryland actually twice, um, community health in 2014, and then the MPH program in behavioral and community health in 2017. Um, I currently am working for the Department of Health and Human Services in the Office of Population Affairs. Um, our office manages grant programs for uh, family planning, teen pregnancy prevention primarily. Um, and I would love to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but I did sort of get here through a, um, a path of doing a lot of different things in public health. I previously worked in substance abuse research. I worked in digital health research for a little bit. but Family planning, reproductive health has sort of been like my baby in the field the entire time. So I'm really excited to have landed back here and um, to be here and talk about it a bit more. Thanks, Kelly. Janae. Well, hello, everyone. I am Janae Hollinger. I um, actually graduated, got my undergraduate degree from Rutgers with um, with biology, Africana studies, and nutrition. And I really like the interaction of all of those three and seeing how, you know, how you keep someone healthy, how their background affects how they look at health, and then how policy affects how you even do that. So I immediately went back and came to Maryland, got my MPH, and I focused in health policy analysis and evaluation in 2019. So not that long ago. I'm currently at HHS as well, um, but I'm very new to my position. I was a public health analyst um, at the Health Resources and Services Administration, and now I'm at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Financial Resources, and I'm in the Congressional Liaison Branch, and my office specifically works with the appropriators for HHS and those committees and subcommittees. So a lot of what I'm doing, and I'm really still learning what I'm actually supposed to be doing, but if you notice when Congress writes bills, a lot of times they'll stipulate within 90 days, you know, they want to know exactly what you're going to do with the money, money that they're giving you, because once they give it to us, they don't know what happens. So they need to so report to Congress. I help with that. Um, the appropriators also might have technical assistance requests, so they may be writing a bill and want to know how um, the funding or the bill is going to affect, um, impact different programs. So we'll help with the technical assistance there as well. So a lot of legislative and congressional re relations kind of things. And let's see, I think that's about it. But again, I'm still learning what I'm doing. I've been here about a month and a half. It's a very huge learning curve for me um, because prior to this, I had never worked in legislation or congressional relations, but I actually received this job through networking. So um, really love to talk about that later and how I got my position. It's a really fun story. Thank you, Janae. We will definitely be visiting um, that as a topic. Um, so we will love to hear that story as well. Brandon, would you mind rounding us out on this question? Yes, absolutely. So hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Graves, and I'm the Workplace Wellbeing Consultant. I'm servicing 
uh, the client site CACI as a representative of Optum, which is the sister company to, if you've heard of United Healthcare, um, the insurance and medical provider. Um, Optum is their health services delivery side. So I graduated from University of Maryland back in 2014, and then I received my master's of science in health promotion management from American University in uh, May of just last year. So I've had the good fortune of being able to work with Optum for the past seven months. And primarily my role um, involves designing, implementing, evaluating, and essentially spearheading the corporate wellness strategy for the CACI International Client Site. And so I'm primarily uh, in charge of the strategic direction through their health promotion and their health education realms, in which my day-to-day -day operations mainly consist of meeting with vendors in order to coordinate, create programs for employees to have access to the resources in order to improve their personal health objectives for not only themselves, but also for their families. And um, one of the things that I love about my field is that I'm really passionate about it. Um, I also hold certifications in health coaching, personal training um, from the American Council on Exercise. I also hold a certification as a certified worksite wellness specialist through the National Wellness Institute, in which I'm also a member. And um, it, it's easy to say that uh, health wellness has been a primary passion of mine, and I'm so fortunate to be able to work in this field in which I help individuals every day improve their quality of lives for themselves and their families. And um, I look forward to explaining more about that throughout the uh, duration of this panel. Excellent. Thanks so much, uh, Brandon, Kelly, and Janae for uh, giving us just a quick intro to kind of you and, and, and what your uh, position right now is doing. Um, so just a reminder to students, um, as you have questions, please feel free to type those to me in the chat. Um, I do want to make sure that we prioritize the information you want to hear. Um, but while I'm waiting for some of those to come in, I'll start us uh, off on our next question, which just is um, any advice for gaining experience in your field um, that you might have for students um, and how they can kind of start building that experience now? I don't know anyone who wants to go. There's only three of you, so. <laughs> I guess I'll take the first shot at it. <laughs> so I would say one of the best ways that someone told me to originally start getting experience is volunteering. So um, if you're fortunate enough to be in a position where you can do something that is unpaid, that's a good way to get in the door. You know, everywhere, not everywhere, but a lot of places do need help. And so they might not be able to pay you, but they'll say, hey, well, if you come on, you can help. Maybe it might be clerical stuff, but even in doing clerical stuff, and reading the papers that come through and the materials that come through, you get a lot of exposure to the day-to-day -day operations and kind of what goes on behind the scenes. So that's how I got my first start. Um, my first internship, just volunteer experience was just saying, hey, I don't really have any experience, but you probably need help. Um, can I come on and be a volunteer? And I was a student volunteer for a summer. So that was how I got my foot in the door. And then once you kind of have that kind of experience on your resume, you may be, be able to move on to more paid internships and paid positions. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And um, I think sometimes when we think of volunteering or unpaid internships, it's, it sounds very burdensome and, and they can be certainly. Um, but, you know, even consider opportunities that may be a one-time thing, like if you're able to volunteer at a health fair or something like that, it's just a few hours, one time, the way to get your foot in the door and a way to meet people in the field. Um, networking is something that has always been really difficult for me, but I think those are really great opportunities in a post-COVID world where, uh, you know, where health fairs and things like that will um, will be more normal and frequent. But, um, you know, those are some of my really early exposures to just sort of being out in the field and, um, and meeting people as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, I would like to piggyback off of that and just say, whether it's volunteering, um, whether it's starting small via networking, seeing, meeting somebody who um, works in the field and does what you want to do and just sending them a message to see if they can be a resource or if they can point you in the right direction in order to help getting your, in order to help get your career started. As well as, you know, as uh, students really trying to be strategic with your electives and your class choices can also help provide employers, uh, you know, with 
the foundation that you have the knowledge to perform some of the competencies that are required for the job. Um, and also in being strategic about it, um, I suggest having a sort of niche thing that uh, you can use to make yourself more marketable. Uh, from my personal experience, I served as a personal trainer prior to entering the world of workplace wellness. And so I was able to market and sell myself during my interview in order to immediately add value, letting them know that there is already a certain uh, list of skills that I possess that I'll be able to implement as soon as I get in the door. And then also having that hunger to be able to constantly learn, being able to um, seek opportunities, whether it's joining organizations, whether it's attending conferences, whether it's, it's really just creating opportunities and avenues for you to learn everywhere so that you can maximize your services um, with whatever it is that you wanna do within the public health realm. Awesome, thank you. And Brandon, um, absolutely. I want to take a second to to kind of bounce off your point of, you know, having that that prior experience that maybe wasn't exactly related to wellness consulting or worksite wellness, but just having that understanding or experience in a related field. Um, you know, remembering that as you're looking for internships, as you're looking for volunteer positions, you don't have to be doing the exact same thing that you're looking to get into. There are lots of transfer transferable skills, transferable knowledge um, that cuts across all these things. So never downplay the experience you have in your past um, just because it's not immediately relevant to the position, um, you know, you're applying to. So um, thank you for, for kind of talking that up as well, the well-rounded experience. Um, all right, so we have had some really great um, kind of questions come in. Um, so keeping with Brandon, but also Kelly and uh, Janae, if you have any experience with this in kind of either your current job or, or past jobs. Um, so Brandon, if you um, had to do a, a consulting case interview um, for this position, um, one of our students is wondering how you kind of prepared for that and what was your experience with it? Um, if not, we can move on, but <laughs> uh, just to make sure I understand the question, um, with me interviewing somebody else, like say, if I was to bring somebody onto my team or kind of the interviewing process that I went through in order to, um, become a consultant, I'm just trying I believe to believe it is the, um, <laughs> clarification as the interviewee. Um, so as okay. you were interviewing for your current position, um, yeah. you know, did you have that that kind of case interview where you had to come in and, and were given a case and you had to kind of run through, what do you do in this situation? <laughs> well, yeah. Oh my goodness. My interviewing process was so rigorous. If I could, if I could completely be real, I had about seven to eight different interviews. Um, I had about two peer interviews and then an, uh, two separate interviews and one prep session with my current director. Um, two interviews, one interview with the account management team, one interview with another consulting team that I work with, and then a finalist interview with the client site themselves, and then everybody else who I had already in, uh, interviewed me. So throughout that process, there were um, specific instances such as, you know, pertaining to work say, workplace wellness, such as experiences programming that I've done, um, the dimensions of wellness that I've covered, because one thing about workplace wellness is not always emphasis on working out or moving more, eating right, and making sure you get enough sleep. We also address financial um, competencies, mental health issues, um, occupational safety, things of that nature. So having to Already having my experience, because um, I was working for about five years at another location prior to doing my consulting role. So I was really able to talk up my experience as it related to each one of those dimensions of wellness. Um, and one of the things that that allowed me to do was show my versatility and my adaptability when going into the client site. So they gave me a bunch of different scenarios. How would you handle this? How would you handle that? And one of the things that I would like to encourage students is even throughout the interviewing process speak to your experience whether you've done something as a class project whether you've done it for a volunteer group um, really do not downplay anything that you've done because you never know when it will be able to represent itself and show that you can do what it is you're 
is being asked of you. So hopefully that answers the uh, answers your question. Yeah, I think so. In terms of maybe is there a way that you kind of prepared for that that you found very effective or that you would kind of suggest um, um, students to kind of run through? Right. Well, one of the way I mean, of course, just for me listing out everything that I've done, I've kept a work portfolio um, of all of my previous uh, projects, uh, programs, things of that nature. And then I was able to present that during uh, my finalist interview. Um, in addition to that, working closely with my director to make sure that we were able to touch on all of the points that we anticipated the client site asking. Um, so reading articles pertaining to worksite wellness, staying up to date on the latest industry trends, becoming familiar with wellness best practices, um, seeing if there's any research that is out there to show the validity of workplace wellness programs, and then tying that all in with my experience. Um, oh, and one thing that I did do um, at my finals, which I feel like landed me the position, was I typed up an agenda, um, like an order of operations for my finalist interview, basically telling them what I plan to talk about. Uh, to help save them time and also to keep me prepared and on track, show them that I am the kind of person that can take initiative and is deserving of uh, this leadership role. So all of that uh, preparation definitely aided me in landing the position. Thank you, Brandon. Um, while we're on the topic of kind of interviewing, Janae and Kelly, if you have anything additional that you would like to share um, before we kind of move on to, to the next questions that are coming in, um, I think our students would really love to hear it. The only thing I'll just echo not to discount any experience that you have. I think a lot of experience in public health is on the job training. And I think a lot of people recognize that too. Um, and I think, and I mean, again, a lot of it is initiative. So absolutely highlight projects that you've done, absolutely anything that you've done in school, any volunteering, you know, even if you've shadowed someone at work and witness the situation that you know you found enlightening and just share any of your experience that you have that could apply to what the experience that you may have on this job is um and i just i absolutely think that everyone in public health is really understanding that a lot of work is uh is really learned on the job and you'll get a lot of your experience there so definitely don't discount any of your experiences Thanks. Did, Janae, did you want to add anything or your fellow? Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I didn't know I couldn't mute from my phone. I'm not too um, here. But the only thing that I did want to add, um, I did kind of miss part of Brandon. So sorry about if anything is kind of duplicative. Um, but one of the things that I would definitely add is in the interviewing process, some allow you to bring notes if you have deliverables or anything like that that you have from projects or papers or anything that you worked on in past positions that could also also be useful in kind of showcasing what you can do not everyone's going to take them but you never know who will and that can also be um, a good way to kind of highlight what you've done if say for instance it's hard for you to articulate what you have done so that's just one other thing awesome thank you um so moving on we have another um question um so each of you has uh, a master's degree of, of some kind. And so this question is related to, you know, in terms of really progressing within the health field, um, you know, do you feel that you need a master's degree? And I will actually tack on to this question because I know, um, Callie, you have uh, your CHES. Um, and I, I know that Brandon has a few other kind of certifications. Um, and Janae, I don't know if you have any as well, but um, if you could kind of speak to that main question of, you know, from your experience and your observations within that, that health field is a master's degree, you know, necessary for progress, but also speak a little to, to the idea of these kind of public health certifications and different types of certifications that, um, that are common and or, or useful in, in furthering your career. Maybe Callie, do you want to start? Sure, yeah, so I have the uh, CATS 
certification, which is a certified health education specialist. Um, and I took that test actually right after I finished the bachelor's program, which I definitely recommend if you're interested um, in that certificate because it's all just really fresh then. Um, and so that certification is really helpful for health educator positions. Usually it's in health departments. Um, I also did have a tiny little stint in workplace wellness, so I think it, it might be um, applicable there too. Um, so, um, you know, it's definitely a helpful certification to sort of get on your feet in the field of public health. I don't use it so much anymore um, in my current position. But um, in regards to just progressing in the field, I think it completely depends what you want to do um, and sort of your goals of, you know, why exactly you want to have um, a, a master's. Um, for me personally, I made the decision because I felt like I wouldn't go back to school if I didn't, um, you know, at that point in time when I decided to. And um, you know, I, I was interested in sort of being in the field of research and just thinking sort of long-term salary implications too. I felt like I needed um, a more advanced degree in order to progress. Um, but I know that's not always the case. It really just depends what you want to do. Okay. Yes. All right. I'm unmuted now. So I would like to piggyback off of Callie. You know, it really does depend on where your interests lie and, and thinking about your objectives for your career um, long term, whether or not you feel that it would benefit you or not. Um, from my experience, I have known individuals within my role who don't have a master's degree, but they have tons of experience and they have um, ton, they've had tons of opportunities in order to uh, progress themselves. And then I have other, I know other professionals that went back to go get a master's degree in order to make themselves more marketable in order to progress. Um, so it really just depends on what it is that you see yourself doing long term. One of the reasons why I went back to pursue my master's degree was due to a personal experience in which I wanted to move up. I did an interview and everything for it, but I was denied because of my age as well as uh, they felt that I didn't have enough qualifications on paper. Um, so that's why I I went back to make sure that nobody else could tell me that I'm not qualified uh, due to the work that I put in and, you know, to submit myself as a leader in the industry and um, things of that nature. One of the reasons why I went to pursue my certifications was, again, to make myself more marketable, as well as to follow my own passion of learning and trying to get uh, more credentials out of it. So I use those certifications as an opportunity to, uh, again, make myself more knowledgeable, more well-rounded, a better servant to the community that I'm called to serve, as well as to, um, well, with my health coaching, it was more so to understand health behavior on a person-to-person -person level. Um, so that way I can take what I know for workplace wellness and implement it on a macroeconomic level within the organization. So do you need it? Depends on what you're trying to do. But one thing I will say is the knowledge, the experience, the connections, the network that you get out of pursuing a graduate level degree definitely does not hurt your chances either because I've made so many valuable peer connections off and acquired so many great experiences from my graduate programs that I can attest that it has contributed towards the progression and continued success in my career. So I won't say too much because I'm really just going to say exactly what they're saying is, uh, is that if you really want to do something very specific, that's I, th I think when that will help help. But for me, for instance, my undergraduate degree was not in public health. I didn't take my first public health class till my junior, senior year. And by then I was just like, I'm not staying extra years. I might as well just go ahead and get my master's. But I have, I do know people who went straight from their bachelor's um, and was able to get into the field. But like he just said, I was able to get into the field at a higher place or enter maybe at a higher salary, different type of position because I did have my master's in hand. So I think it really does all depend on the type of experience that you want.
Thank you all for that. And, and I will say um, for those of you um, who are debating, you know, whether to get the MPH now, whether to wait, what to do um, across the board as you think about pursuing, you know, even higher levels of education, um, as you start to get into those programs, they start to be a lot more specific, a lot more targeted. Um, and so before you jump in, um, you know, kind of as, as everyone, as all of our panels have been saying, um, you know, it's good to know what you're doing it for, right? So what are your specific goals? Because um, you want to make sure that it, it costs money, right? There's a cost benefit um, for all these things. So you want to make sure that you're not kind of putting all of your eggs, right? Your monetary eggs into this basket if it's not the thing you really want to do. Um, and so, you know, whether it's through internships now or taking a gap year or doing whatever that is, um, just making sure that by the time you do go back, um, you know, that, that you're doing it with a specific purpose in mind. Um, before we leave this topic completely, um, we did have a follow-up, um, Callie, about the CHES, um, and just to elaborate a little bit more on exactly kind of what that is and maybe some examples of how the certification helped you um, or, or times when you specifically used it. Yeah, so it is um, sort of the gold standard health educator certification. Um, it's run by NCHEC. It's the national, oh my gosh, I'm just going to totally space on it, but <laughs> of course. Um, but that, that's where you'll get all of the information. It's NCHEC. Um, and they are sort of the certifying board. The qualifications, just because it's been about seven years since I first took the exam, so it may have changed, but um, you do need an undergraduate degree in community or public health, community health, something along those lines in order to qualify, which is honestly very great because you do get the foundation during school. Um, there's definitely studying that I did on top of it and absolutely recommend. Um, but those are sort of the baseline qualifications, if I remember correctly. Um, I was interested in getting it because my first internship, I was working for a health department in HIV and STI prevention education. Um, and I, like I said, on the job learning, I learned a ton of facilitate, facilitation strategies on the job, but felt like having the certification just made my work and sort of my credentials a little bit more legitimate um, by having that certification. So um, that was my main um, experience in health education um, and why I pursued it. But I do feel like when you have a certification, it does apply throughout other experiences. Um, you know, my next job after that was in substance abuse education, or sorry, substance abuse research, but there were opportunities along the way to provide education and, you know, those experiences that I had um, from, you know, working in health education in research. And that sort of has gone along the way, even though right now I'm not directly working in health education, there are always those opportunities through the programs that we fund and the research that we conduct to sort of talk about health education principles. So um, if you're even loosely interested in doing some form of health education, I definitely recommend it. Um, there are continuing education credits that you have to do every year and then every five years in order to maintain the certification. So it is a really good way to also just sort of stay updated on the latest practices and research as well. Great, thanks Callie. Um, moving on now, we had, uh, we have a question about, um, any advice you have on kind of finding internships during this pandemic. Um, but in a larger sense, I had also kind of prepared a, a question on just kind of the general impacts of COVID, um, that you've seen on your field, um, you know, both in the short term and long term. Um, so it's kind of a loaded question, but maybe we can start with the kind of, you know, impacts that you're seeing and then um, any, any suggestions or um, advice you might have on finding internships kind of during this time, either with your organization or just kind of some general tips. So I would say, at least starting with the part about like finding internships, especially during this time, I think that while networking has changed because it's not face-to-face, -face, you may not have um, that same connection or it might not be as easy because you're not in person. I think that um, regardless of whether or not it's in person or virtual, that networking will always be very helpful when finding internships. 
And, you know, just also realizing that the people that you connect with might not be the ones offering you the internship or the position, but they may be very educated about the process, um, can give you tips and insights into um, how it goes, what they're looking for, those types of things, and to really lean on your professors and people at the school. Uh, that's how I got some of my first internships, the resources that I was provided through the director of my program, which is amazing. And so having those type of resources and them being able to just point you in the right direction, because once you, at least for me, once I started finding internships and figuring out like where exactly to look, what terms I'm supposed to be using, you know, those kind of things, I started finding them everywhere. And then it's like, wow, there are really are so many. And so I think like just getting started and again, figuring out how to orient yourself in terms of the search is very helpful. Um, and then how impact, how COVID has kind of impacted my field. I would say one thing that has happened, at least in terms of workplace culture, um, really didn't know how much I would miss like interacting with my coworkers in person. And we have done a few extra things that maybe we wouldn't have done in person to really kind of keep that connection up because that does impact how well you work with your team. You spend a lot of time with your coworkers and you don't really realize it until you kind of count the hours. You spend just as much time with them as you may with your friends and your family. And so that was something that my boss did a good job of doing is keeping up the connection so that that communication doesn't change. You know, being able to stop by someone's office, now you have to send a Skype or an email. And it's like, oh, it feels more of a burden than if we just stop by and ask a question. And so I think that has really highlighted how important workplace culture is to me. And especially now having onboarded in the virtual environment, which was just like very, very, not hard, but it was more difficult that I would say, you know, you can't just walk by and someone can pull you into a meeting and say, hey, come sit in on this. You know, it's, it's a little bit harder or what's a little bit harder, I think, for me to kind of um, get acclimated in the position just because it was virtual. But for me, in terms of workplace culture, that's what um, COVID has really highlighted for me, the importance of that, because um, that was important in how we kind of kept up our morale while we were doing our work. Yeah, as I 100% would like to um, agree with Janae about utilizing, you know, university resources, utilizing your professors, um, as, as far as getting internships and, you know, trying to acquire those experience. I'd also recommend uh, like LinkedIn is a great resource. Um, you can also Google, like say you have a position in mind, you can Google um, organizations that may have that position, see who that contact is, find them on LinkedIn and then reach out that way, ask about any questions. And at the very least, if, you know, an internship opportunity or like maybe a part-time opportunity were to come up, um, you'll be at the top of that individual's mind. And even if it's not with their organization. Uh, one thing that I will say is we have peers who uh, essentially do uh, the same thing, if not something similar at other lower organizations for other companies. So, you know, contacting professionals that are already working in the field to at least get pointed in the right direction can be a very uh, beneficial way to start that whole internship um, entry level experience process. And as far as the way that COVID-19 has shifted the workplace wellness culture, um, it's done about two different two different things that I can uh, recall from the top of my head. The first thing is that the transition from on-site health education events, such as wellness fairs, such as other health promotion programs like fitness, exercise classes, mindfulness meditation, um, yoga, financial webinars, things of that nature that are all in person, no longer are in person. So having to completely shift over to a virtual format has been uh, one of the more challenging aspects because as health promotion individuals, one of the things that I noticed about me and all of us is that we're people. We're like people, people, people persons. So um, not having that person to person interaction and really being able to maximize those interpersonal relationships that you develop throughout the tenure of your position has been pretty challenging. And similar to what Janae said about being onboarded during COVID-19 has been uh, challenging as well, not necessarily having those same day-to-day -day experiences that you would in the office. But on the other side is that health education and health promotion are on a 
upward trend um, just since I, well, with my position having been first posted and um, me being onboarded throughout COVID-19, as well as just in our director's team alone, we had two to three people that came after me. So organizations are prioritizing the health of their employees at an all time high right now, um, given that one of the uh, caveats to COVID-19 was that if you had a pre-existing condition, you're more likely to um, have COVID-19. So with that in mind, um, employers are looking to make sure that their employees are the healthiest possible. And so they're rerouting a lot of the their funds that were allocated for other departments and pouring them into wellness um, because they're realizing that these primary and secondary prevention methods can be just as efficacious for, uh, you know, kind of maintaining the population health of their organization. Yeah, so um searching for an internship during a pandemic. I unfortunately don't have a, a ton of insight on that, but um, one thing that I will highlight is um, just for the federal service is there always is an ongoing internship program that has always been virtual um, and might be a good thing to look into. It's called the um, Virtual Student Federal Service Internship. I think it's vsfs.state.org, which I can send to Lauren afterwards, but um, typically, internship opportunities are released, I believe it's early summer. Um, and different organizations, different departments will basically um, have a project or something that they need help with. Um, and it's specifically for students. And I believe it's an application process as any other internship would be, but you just complete the work um, virtually. So um, that might be something interesting to look into, um, especially during a pandemic when things are, um, are virtual. So um, just, you know, a, a resource to consider there. Um, I will echo um, that, it, you know, it's mostly in my workplace that has been the shift to working remotely and sort of like the interpersonal relationships that are, um, you know, just different now having to do everything virtually. Um, from my sort of work project perspective, um, a lot of the organizations that we work with work in health centers, in schools, in community centers. And so just working with them, trying to pivot so that they can, you know, do the work that serves their communities, but in, you know, just a sort of different way now. A lot of our programs that were previously implemented in schools are going virtual. So um, it's a lot of sort of, you know, working as we go throughout this process, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. Um, I think a lot of organizations are doing. So um, that's, you know, that's definitely been um, an interesting challenge of the last year. Thank you all. Um, this next question is is kind of specifically for, uh, for Callie and Janae. Um, so the question is, you know, the title public health analyst. Basically the question is public health analyst, what is it? Um, so it's an incredibly common title that you see given a lot. Um, so in particular, you know, what does it look like for you as a public health analyst, um, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, what are kind of some of the roles that you, or sorry, the, um, yeah, the roles that you fill and the jobs you perform? Janae, you want to start us? So I can go first. Sure, because I, I've actually been a public health analyst now at two different agencies and do two different completely different things. So I would say the first thing I learned going into the workplace is that titles mean things, but then they also don't. <laughs> so um, for instance, when I was a public health analyst at the Health Resources and Services Administration, I was in the immediate office of the administrator. And so I worked on special projects that were assigned by him. So for instance, I work on I worked on the Advancing American Kidney Health Initiative. And in that project, I worked with a lot of internal external stakeholders to carry out the executive order where we were trying to, you know, increase the amount of available organs um, for transplant, um, um, decrease the amount of people that were getting in stage renal disease. And that was one project. And that was a lot of communication, mostly connecting people to other people so that they can do their jobs. But there was another project where I got to work on 
the department's first rural action plan in about 20 years. And what that was, was a lot of researching, a lot of reaching out to different agencies and seeing what they've been doing lately um, in rural health so that we could document and say, hey, this is what HHS has been doing this past, the past few years, and this is what they're going to be doing moving forward. And so, like I said, that was a lot of creating documents to send out to agencies, collecting the information, um, distilling it down to what we really needed and producing. It was about an 80 page document in the end. And then also just doing things that the administrator needed to be done on a daily basis, whether that was helping with his speeches, helping with talking points, creating slides or when he's talking to different organizations. And so that's what I did there as a public health analyst. But now I'm in a different office with the exact same title and no overlapping roles or duties. So here I'm really working mostly with like congressional or in the space of congressional relations, legislative affairs, those types of things. And now it really looks like um, just a lot more legislation. Um, again, uh, speaking with the appropriation committees and the staffers, sometimes giving briefings if staffers are new so that they understand what's in the portfolio. So again, completely different. And the more you talk to people, the more you'll see that it really does depend where you are. And even in the same agency, maybe who your boss is and how they like to delegate roles and duties. So I'm sure your husband's been completely different from Cali as well. Yeah, I think both of our experiences will just highlight that it could mean anything. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so I, um, in my role, I, um, my, my primary role is to manage um, research grants in family planning and teen pregnancy prevention. So I manage a portfolio of um, 11 different grants right now, and um, they all are implementing different projects. Um, and they essentially just had to write their projects based on what we were funding. And we typically leave that fairly broad um, because different communities have different needs. Um, so from day to day, a lot of time it's sort of consulting with these, um, the organizations, the project directors that are implementing these projects. Um, I also help with writing the funding announcements. We have grants, cooperative agreements and contracts as well. Um, we have large um, contracts that do evaluations of federal programs, sometimes across different organizations, sometimes just within our organization. So um, it could be, you know, tasks related to that as well. So um, I personally really love my job because it is very varied. And I think it, I, I think of it as in the seasons, like the winter is when we write the funding announcements and, you know, the summer is when we award them. So, you know, there's always something new that's happening. There are always new researchers and organizations to work with. So, um, you know, it, it, it might sound a little bit muddied and blurry, but I personally love that about public health in general and my job, there's always something new happening. Thank you both for providing that insight. Um, and I think I'll take this moment just to mention a lot of times when you're looking at really big organizations, especially government, even at the University of Maryland, I'm like my, my title is technically program director. That's it. It doesn't even say program director of career stuff, right? Like that's it. Um, really what you're looking at that title is describing um, kind of what the, what they say a pay band, right? So it's like a person in this position has these qualifications and at this organization will make from this much to this much. Um, and that's really what those things are tied to when you get to these very big organizations, because the reality is dependent on the office, dependent on, um, the supervisor, dependent on the year, there might be different things that are required of that position. And so it's very hard to give a very specific title. Um, so instead, they kind of rely on a general title um, across the organization that then um, kind of correlates to something that can be standardized. Um, but in reality, the position title, um, especially when you're looking and doing a job search, what's going to be the best place to look is looking at um, the job kind of responsibility, um, looking more into what specifically does that office do? What projects are they working on? Um, and like our panelists have said today, um, trying to find people who work in that office or work with that organization and talking to them about what they do. So um, exactly like what you're all doing right now. Um, okay, so moving on to our next question, um, and we'll start with Brandon on this one because you got a little left out on the last question. Um, but in terms of you know, and I guess I know both Janae and Brandon, you both are kind of recent to your positions. Um, 
but where are you looking at going next, right? So um, kind of both are there opportunities within your organization to, you know, quote unquote, climb the ladder um, or, or, you know, what are those kind of next steps in your personal careers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great question. Uh, luckily, within Optum, there are opportunities to climb up the, uh, the corporate ladder, if you will. Um, my next thing is I'm looking to take my boss's position, not put her out of work, but uh, just assume the roles and responsibilities that she has of uh, being able to manage multiple you know, essentially oversee uh, the well-being strategy for multiple client sites as opposed to just for one client site. Um, that's more like a three to five year plan. Uh, the one to three year plan is to continue to develop um, the corporate well-being strategy within CACI. And eventually, I know I'm going to have an opportunity to hire two and manage two people um, who will report to me. And I and it's good. I haven't really done any uh, management work since I was a personal trainer, but I'll be looking forward to that. And more so uh, later on down the road, my my dream and what I'm going to do is open up a wellness center. Um, yeah, open up a wellness center. Uh, pretty much everything health housed in one location. Um, I'll be going. I'm currently in the process of vetting doctorate programs to go back and uh, get a DRPH in order to position myself as a leader um, and make that dream come true. So I, I guess I can go next there. Um, somebody told me once that whenever you enter a position, you should always know your next move before you even start that position, just so that you have an understanding of your experience and your journey and how your current position is going to lead you to the next one. So for me, I'm finally getting into that legislative and congressional space. Um, so I think, and the good thing that the thing that I really like about the position that I'm in right now is that I have a very broad portfolio. So I'm going to be helping with the Office of Global Affairs, the Office of Women's Health, um, some of the Office of Secretary portfolios. So I'm really going to get legislative and congressional experience, but also um, exposure to a lot of different fields. And for me right now, I don't feel like I'm a specialist at all. I'm very much so a generalist and that's completely fine. Um, that I found completely fine, but I want to find my niche. And so for me, now that I'm in this space, I want to find maybe what I feel the most connected to and use my experience with Congress to make an impact in that community or in that space. So, right, I would say my next move is to maybe move into that um, I'm not sure if I want to leave government to do, or if I have to leave government to do that, or if I want to go to the private sector. So that's something I'm not sure about, but I do know the trajectory of where I want to go and how this position will get me there. So um, hopefully I can find my niche. And I also do think when I find my niche that I also want to go back. I'm not vetting programs just yet because I still am like school, I cannot do right now. But in the near future, I do want to start also looking to doctor programs as well to again, help me specialize in that field and kind of um, achieve um, goals in that area. Yeah, so one of the things that I actually really like about government is I think that the career path is very defined. Um, there are sort of ladder positions that you apply to. So, um, you know, you can move up and, you know, as Lauren sort of mentioned, pay bands, but with pay bands also comes responsibilities. So, um, for me, that's what I'm looking to do. I think at this point that I'm interested in staying in the government for the long term, but you know, you never know what could happen. Um, so in my current role, I am, you know, as I mentioned, I'm sort of managing my own small portfolio of grants. Um, I'm really interested in taking on more responsibility, potentially becoming a team lead down the line. Um, and sort of on the same page as, as Janae about doctorate programs, I sort of, you know, fiddle with the thought, but, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens <laughs> down the road. Excellent. Thank you all for that. And I, I think, um, Janae, what you said, uh, the advice that you were given of always knowing what the next step is before you're even in, in your current step. Um, is so great and insightful. And I, I think you all kind of demonstrated very different ideas of what that means, right? Um, so whether it's, you know, Brandon, you clearly have your like track, you're like this and then that, and this is what I'm gonna do. And that's great. 
um, and awesome. And I'm so energized, like listening to you talk about it. Um, I love Janae, how you're like, listen, this is what I know I want to do. Um, and I'm just going to keep stepping towards that. And I'm just going to keep pursuing the things I'm interested in. And then that's where I want to get. And then, you know, Callie saying, Hey, the government, they give you your steps. <laughs> they say, here's my next one. And then there's my next one. And it's great. Um, but, but I think what you're all highlighting is kind of following that passion and that interest that you have and letting that kind of guide those next steps. Um, so being very conscious of time, um, one thing that I, um, I would like for each of you to talk about is kind of how your, your interests, um, Callie, I know this is something you wanted to kind of talk about originally and it dovetails well, but how have kind of your, your interests led you to this point or this career? Um, you know, was this necessarily something that you were like, I'm going to be a public health analyst someday, or was it something that you found along the way? Um, and, and just kind of walk us through that process of getting to where you are. Callie, would you mind starting? Yeah, sure. So I, um, as I mentioned, my first internship was in HIV and STI prevention. And with that, you sort of touch on family planning and, um, you know, just more as a broad topic. And I just absolutely fell in love with that field. Um, and, but it's a, it is an extremely niche field. And I had a really hard time finding um, an opportunity after that internship. Um, it felt like there were a lot of listings that specifically needed a lot of experience behind it. So I figured, you know, going along the line of transferable skills, um, you know, taking a job that was in the field of public health sort of had the same, um, you know, responsibilities or just exposures as something in STI prevention or just in general education um, would have. Um, and, you know, landed in a position where I was working in research, but working with community members and then ended up, um, you know, when I went to grad school, I, I sort of wanted to focus on family planning to gain that experience. And this sort of, you know, goes right back to uh, working on projects in a field that you're interested in. And then when you work, when you interview, highlighting those projects, you know, the projects that I was working on, they weren't necessarily work experience, but I spent a ton of time doing the research. I had an advisor who helped me a lot too, and has that expertise as well. So, um, you know, just to always, you know, sort of take those opportunities as they come. Um, and then the way that I landed in this job is actually very strange. Um, I, I was a fellow, um, that's how I started, but found out about this fellowship opportunity from my husband who was a physical therapist and his patient worked in the office and was man mentioning off, you know, just off the cuff, we're hiring fellows. And he was like, what? Like, this is her field. This is what she loves. So, um, you know, not that that was a direct networking experience, but it's a really good, um, you know, opportunity to just highlight the connections that you make with people and you never know um, what could come of it. I guess I can go next. Um, how I got to my position right now is kind of similar uh, story, actually. So I did, and once I graduated from, once I got my undergrad degree, I did say, "Hey, I want to be a public health analyst." But that's because that's the title I mostly saw. So somehow fate brought me there, but didn't bring me to what I thought I would be doing. I personally, when I first heard about and started learning about public health, really thought that I wanted to be on the very ground level. So I was able to intern at a county health department um, and we met with different coalitions um, and I figured out maybe being that close to the work wasn't good for me and how I process things. Uh, mentally, I guess I would say like emotionally when you really work close with the people who you're impacting, it can be good, but I realized for me, maybe that wasn't the best space. And so I started looking into federal opportunities where I could still have an impact and maybe have a broader impact, but still be working in that field. And how I got to this specific position is I kind of, I started doing information interviews during my internship, probably did like 30 of them over the course of the year, because once you talk to one person, they refer you to three people, that person refers you to three people and you kind of just keep it going. And I did get my MPH in health policy, but as I was kind of starting my internship and seeing the connections between different things, I was like, hey, I see there's this intersection between legislation and budget, whereas before, kind of thought they were completely differently. You know, they're different offices. I didn't understand the overlap. And so I started talking to people more and more. And in my journey to figure out what the intersection between budget and legislation was, I ended up talking to my current supervisor now. 
and um, just asking her questions about her experience and, you know, what it looked like. She was on the Hill for a little bit. Um, and she actually, we talked the day before her last day in the office. And for the next year, I kind of checked in with her over maybe once every three or four months. So not a lot, we would talk for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And I was always scared to email her because I'm like, oh, I know she's busy, you know, she's a branch chief now, but hey, if she says yes, and I guess that means she wants to talk. And so we kind of kept in contact. And after a year, she was like, I came to her about a different position that I had been offered in my current agency that I wasn't so sure if it would take me in the direction that I wanted to go. And I was asking for her feedback and she actually said, well, I know you're talking about a position you just got offered, but I'm actually hiring on my team. Would you want to come work for me? And I was like, um, yes. So that's how I ended up in my position now, literally just saying, hey, I see there's an intersection here. I wonder if there's someone I can talk to and somehow got led to her. And, you know, a year later, eventually got brought on. So I say that to say, talk to as many people as you can. And if they say yes, and they take the time out of their busy schedule, then they genuinely do want to talk to you. And, you know, always feel free to follow up with them and do it periodically, even if you feel like you're being annoying. Um, sometimes you never know how much they like you because it ends up in a job for me. So I would say that was my journey, really just figuring out how to enter something and pursuing it um, just by talking to people and then ended up being able to really experience it. And now I can see day to day what that intersection really is. Well, um, my journey was, has been pretty, I, I'd categorize it as a unique one. I kind of fumbled around with not really knowing what I wanted to do um, career-wise when I was in undergrad. Um, I was accepted into Maryland essentially as a biology major. It's my idea to be pre-med. Um, I did, wasn't really feeling that. So I was like, okay, let me try physical therapy out. Um, I worked at an outpatient clinic for about two and a half years and realized that that wasn't the direction that I wanted to go either. What um, brought me to where I am today, I would attest is the public health internship that is required for public health majors. Um, I saw something called, it was a cor uh, corporate wellness intern. And I was like, corporate wellness, I've n I had never heard of it before. I didn't know what it was, but it sounded cool. And I read the um, descriptions of everything. And I was like, okay, it's, this sounds like it's right up my alley. And I remember while everybody was going on their public health internships and I mean their interviews and they had like four or five some people had 10 20 interviews lined up I only had one and that was for uh the DC Metro uh for their corporate wellness intern program and lucky for me that was the only interview that I needed to go on and um that's pretty much what started everything after working on uh, completing the internship and graduating I was hoping I was going to get hired didn't get hired. So I worked as a year um, for a personal trainer. I mean, as a personal trainer um, at an Anytime Fitness franchise in Virginia. Um, about five, six months into working uh, as a personal trainer, that's when I had the opportunity to do some part-time work for a, an adjacent wellness program and the same organization. So instead of working with their corporate side, I was working with their union side. Um, and eventually that led into a full-time position with Transit Employees Health and Welfare Fund, in which I was there for five years. And throughout those five years, that's when I tried to learn as much as I could. Um, it was right after my internship, I specifically remember, I was talking to one of my best friends and I said, yeah, I have a new dream. I want to run a corporate wellness program for a fortune company uh, before I'm 30. <laughs> that was, that was uh, on the objectives list. And so after I got my position um, at, essentially as a worksite wellness specialist, I just learned. That's when I went back to school. That's when I acquired certifications. That's when I really just, I was hungry and I was letting my passion really dictate my path and allowing all of my purpose to come out in everything that I did. And so I honestly applied for the job. I didn't necessarily have any like specific network connections or anything. Um, I apply, I found the job and applied for it on Indeed, went through like eight different interviews and was awarded the position at the tail end of it. So I say all that to say, even if you don't have it all figured out right now, um, trust the process, trust your purpose, get to know yourself and trust that um, 
you'll be guided and you'll be navigated into the space that is meant for you. Because believe me when I say that some things can't even start until you show up. And then that's when you're able to make your mark and you know we can make our impact as public health professionals on the communities all across the globe. Thank you all for those insights. And I think Brandon ending with that, you know, just always be open to learning whatever, you know, um, whatever comes your way, whatever opportunity or experience you're in, try to learn what you can from it. Um, so we're a little over. Thank you to um, everyone who stayed. Thank you for our panelists for your amazing insights today. Um, and I'm just really quickly for students, I'm just going to pop again um, that kiosk um, link into the chat. If you have a minute, just quickly click on that, enter your ID number, um, your UID number, just to let me know you were here. Um, otherwise, I really appreciate Callie, Brandon, Janae, you taking the time um, to sit here and your amazing answers and insights to all of our questions. Thank you to our students who flooded um, with questions, some really amazing questions. Thank you for not having, making me have to go to my backups. Um, I love to see this engagement. And um, for our panelists, would you, not to put you on the spot, would you mind if I um, shared your contact information um, for any students who might have some follow-up questions? We didn't necessarily get to all the questions in the chat. So, um, okay, perfect. Then um, I will be sharing this, uh, the students who are still here, I will be sharing this recording once I have it. Um, and I will also share that uh, contact information so you can follow up. Um, but other than that, thanks again, have a great evening and a great rest of your, your yeah, your evening, rest of your week, beginning. Thank you. <laughs> thanks everyone. Bye.